You're listening to One Free Family, a new take on peaceful parenting, where you can hear ideas for helping to raise free, independent, and peaceful children. Visit OneFreeFamily.com to connect and listen. Here are your hosts, James and Taylor Davis. We're back with another episode of One Free Family. This is James. And Taylor. And we are pumped to talk about what exactly today, to talk about helping kids meet their goals even when meeting their goals feels really hard. And we're going to break this down into a ton of different types of goals they can be in the pursuit of from trying to figure out how to be the next level in a video game all the way up to trying to work through something that might be really difficult emotionally for them. But basically the idea of trying to help our equip our kids to continue to grow, even when that's sometimes hard. Because I think it's one of the biggest questions or implied questions we get about our approach to parenting, which is, well, if you never force your kids how to do X or Y, uh, where does the growth come from? So uh, I'm excited to talk about the topic. But before we do, darling, you're giving me looks like I'm rambling on in the intro. No, sorry. Just just coming off of a little bit of a contentious sound check. What's up? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a sound check for the ages. <laughs> and maybe at some point we'll play your your triumphant victory march when you you quote unquote figured yeah, out how I to get the money. I missed the problem. Go ahead. <laughs> sure you did. But let's do a little housekeeping first. First of all, I just want to thank everyone out there who supports us on Patreon. If you go to onefreefamily.com slash support, you can see our Patreon link there. It's all you folks out there that really make this show possible. Without the support from you, we wouldn't be able to send along money to Roger and his team to edit the episodes, to maintain the website and do all of those things that at this chapter in our life, we simply don't have the time to do. We so don't. it's true. We uh, do really appreciate all of you out there. Thanks to everyone out there in the Facebook group, which we always like to plug. If you look on Facebook for one free family, you'll see a very vibrant community of people supporting one another through tears, laughter, and everything in between. And it's one of the most beautiful places, on, at least on Facebook, if not the entire interwebs. And the world, probably. And the world. I, well, I don't... We yeah, don't want to be too... Probably not. Um, NA-centric here. There's probably plenty of beautiful places in Tibet and elsewhere that you can find internet stuff. Well, you can get this group in Tibet, too, I'm sure. I know. Wouldn't that be amazing? If yeah. you're in Tibet, if you're one of our many listeners in Tibet and you want to join the <laughs> Facebook group, we would love to hear from you. Also, sorry, there was no show last week. Oh, yeah. yeah just an apology. We missed a week there. Complaint we... to the week. We got too Complaint lazy to, to record week. another show. Well, we're not lazy. We used our typical recording <laughs> time last week to talk to Dave from Tours for Families on his yeah. podcast, which we had a ton of fun doing. He was in Mexico talking to us from a co-working space. It was yeah. really fun to chat with him. So I did share that on our platforms, but you can go ahead and check that out. I think we might try to put it up on our feed too. Yeah. At some um, point soon, Dave said he'll send along the yeah. the file and we'll put it up on our feed. If yeah. You... So anyway, we use that time to um, interview with him and then we totally intended to find another time to record, but life just got away from us. Yeah. That'll happen. So you have a, a week sickness, off. More complaints of the week, but yeah, we do have a week off. And by the way, next week, uh, we're going to take our first ever interview on the show. And we are. That's true. Be a surprise guest for now. You'll have to sit at the edge of your seat. A hint is that it is someone from our One Free Family Facebook group. So that'll whet your appetite a little bit. And from there, if you can think of anyone who you think might want to come on the show or would be a good guest for us to interview, feel free to reach out. And I think we should just jump into the James episode. and Taylor at OneFreeFamily.com. That's our email. Yeah. Right? That's one of our many emails. Yeah, one of our many emails. Yeah, we're, we're email rich. That's one of the things that we've got going for us. So goal setting. Talk about goal setting that's going to be different than perhaps you're envisioning at the start of this episode, because on one hand, we will discuss goals like maybe academic type goals or, you know, progression based goals. Your kid wants to learn the violin, whatever. We'll definitely talk about that. But this conversation was actually sparked by an experience we had in our house around one of our kids trying to meet a, a more a heavier goal, I guess we'll put it. And just from feedback and discussions we've seen in the One Free Family group around kids dealing with things like maybe having a temper problem at, at the time or kids not really meeting their own. And I don't think they would put it this way, but interacting with their family in a way that's beneficial for everyone. So basically it's the idea of goals that our kids will totally intrinsically create for themselves and goals that they might not be able to put their finger on, but probably they do have a goal to improve in some way or grow in some way, but it's feeling very, very difficult for them at the time. I don't know if that paints too clear of a picture, but hopefully once we dive in, yeah. you'll get the sense of it. So where do you want to begin? Should we just, I mean, start on a pretty high level here and talk about what we view our role in, in these conversations as? No, I think we should start by talking about like the different types of 
goals that our kids might have or that we might have for our kids and think about kind of what those look like and how we might support our kids to accomplish them, even when it might feel hard. Okay. So uh, we, in our little preparation for the show, obviously we didn't decide what we were going to talk about first because Taylor just disagreed with me. (laughs) But we did talk about, we we had created three general baskets of goals. So the first goal set of basket goals we pointed out were things that they would like to improve at but that's fun for them to improve at. So Right. So this is kind of the easiest category, honestly. Yeah. I think like your kid has a goal to improve at drawing and you find this really cool like online drawing program for them and you show it to them and they love it and they're having so much fun and they they can see where they want to go, but the process for them is really enjoyable. Yeah, so, so that the would adults be the first, role here yeah. is like the facilitator, right? We've seen this with our kids. Uh, Ollie wanted to get more into basketball, so we found a really great basketball program called integrity hoops out here that would from our estimation meet his needs for being treated with kindness and encouragement and his need for like skill development and something a little bit more competitive right so yeah these wind up being i mean this is kind of like the self-directed learner's handbook 101 where it's like okay your kid is interested in something we've done whole episodes on this i believe but your kid is interested in something you notice it you help them continue to develop those interests by maybe helping them find things online or in-person trainings or whatever it is that you're wanting to support them in. Yeah. And and it's pretty clear and apparent when these are goals that they've set for themselves that they're really enjoying the process of reaching. And that's like really, I, for me, that's like the really awesome, juicy part of self-directed education, right? Like it's, you don't have to, you don't find yourself feeling like you have to convince them to practice or convince them to spend a little time on it each day. They're just doing it because they love it. And you can even see that it's hard sometimes, but the the motivation is intrinsic and it's strong enough that they'll, with a little bit of support in finding what they need, they'll just keep on working at it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, right, like you said, this is, you know, the beauty of a self-directed learning approach like we try to take is that, and the other key component here is that you make as much space as you can for the kid to try to pursue that goal, right? Yeah, so, time, just time, right? They they get to direct their own time and choose how to spend it. So if they want to be working on this goal constantly, mm-hmm. for the most part, obviously, Obviously with a few, you know, with a bit of understanding that there's other people in the family and other people need things, but they have the time and space to work on it. Right. And I will say like in my experience, this is also the easiest thing for me to do as a parent of a self-direct of many self-directed learners down <laughs> at this point, because it's fun. It's fun to totally. see your kid jump in and go from what's this uh, Fortnite game here to go to then being able to do these incredibly impressive things within the context of the game, or you see your kid pick up that violin for the first time, and then they're performing at a recital six months later, and everyone is like, wow, how's this kid so good at violin? You know, they're only six years old. That part feels like you're like, oh, right, this is why I got into this business Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the first place. And as you can probably tell from how we're approaching this, this isn't really what we're going to dive too deeply into right. on this episode, because I actually think the second basket of goals is where things begin to become a little bit more nuanced. So this, and this actually can happen in those, you know, there can be some overlap between basket one and this basket two. And so this basket is when your child wants to improve at something that's kind of tedious, but it's a skill that they would like to develop. And so what are some examples of things like this in your mind? Yeah. So I think there was a time period when our oldest wanted to be a fluent reader Mm. and he came to us kind of saying like, I really wish I could read. And that was, that was kind of a trickier situation because he wanted to have the skills, but whenever we tried to sit down and kind of work on it with him, he did not want to sit there and do whatever the ideas we came up with to help him were. Ultimately the way that one played out was it was clear he wasn't really interested in doing the work at the time. And so we just let it go. And then a year and a half later, reading just all clicked for him from all of the other things that he's doing in his life that have been helping him to practice. So that's one example. I think it's like he wanted the skill, but he didn't really want it enough to sit down and do the hard work to get there at the time. And actually, maybe I was ready to just move right on, but maybe that's really important to talk about because I think I hear parents feel challenged by that a lot, like feel challenged by the idea of like, Their kid has a skill that the child themselves has said they really, really want to master or something they want to be able to do. But then when when it comes down to it, 
the kid doesn't want to put in the work to get there. I think uh, it's like really easy as a parent to have a knee jerk reaction of like, oh my God, my kid's never going to work hard at anything. This is terrible. I'm doing everything wrong. <laughs> like I've definitely been there. Like, well, when will they ever like sit down and do the hard work? Right? right. And so that's a really hard place to be as a parent, especially if you're just venturing into this more self-directed learning approach. So I don't know, what would you say, James, to like kind of, obviously I want to leave space for that and honor that that's a hard place to be. And how would you suggest people maybe kind of come to terms with that or think about that? Yeah. I mean, this is really, really hard because it, it mostly depends on the level of urgency around that skill acquisition, yeah. right? So if your child is in school and I don't really even know what grade kids are made to learn to read in school, but let's call it second grade. They should be like pretty proficient by second grade. Okay. Yeah. So they should be pretty proficient by second grade. Like seven, eight years old. If your kid is in school and simply refusing to try and gain proficiency at reading, there will be some serious problems in third grade and some major problems in fourth grade. It's going to make, it, right? it's gonna make um, their daily life really hard. Exactly. And so in a case like that, I think a conversation around the potential ramifications around, you know, not developing these skills. I think at that point you're faced with the reality where unless you can change your lifestyle around so that your child can be more self-directed, yeah. you're in a pretty urgent situation. And so that's one example. I think though that there's a lot fewer examples of things that kids must learn on a very short time frame yeah. than many kids or many parents will give credit for. And I know this from seeing how parents mentally approach all sorts of different skills that they feel very urgently about their kids. Actually, one of the ones that I see the most often is when their kid has demonstrated some amount of talent for something. This actually came up in mm. the group as well. There's a, a woman who posted about how you know, she's a gifted musician. She's a music teacher. Her family is full of musicians and her son is a musician, but he doesn't seem to approach uh, learning whatever instrument. I don't want to you know, give too many details here because uh, we didn't check in with her or anything, but she didn't want to give too many, or uh, he didn't want to go too deep on learning this next instrument because for whatever reason, he wasn't motivated to do so but she could see he was really talented at it for the amount of time he had put in, you know, and the music teacher, I believe had, or his, is the person giving him lessons. His instructor had given them reason to believe that he was very gifted for the amount of time he had put in, but he didn't want to seem to get over the hump and work on like the tedious, like learning the scales, the music theory, uh, whatever he might need to, to take the next step. I think in a case like that, it can feel very urgent for the parent, right? Uh, you're like, well, geez, like he's so close to these breakthroughs. He'll feel so satisfied if he becomes a great musician. Like, yeah, it's really exciting to see our kids flourish and be exceptional at things. And, right. Yeah. So the hard part here for me, because I think prevailing wisdom in parenting is that, well, you just got to push your kid through those hard moments mm -hmm. because if they come out on the other side with the skill, they'll feel really grateful for having put the work in. Yeah. And I have to say that I kind of fundamentally disagree there. And I can speak from experience here on some level. So there are skills that I gained in my youth, actually playing the trombone is one <laughs> back to the musical instrument piece. I gained skill at playing the trombone first because it seemed interesting to me. And then that interest waned and it actually wasn't my parents here, but my music teacher in middle school who would talk to me all about how I was gifted at playing the trombone and how like, couldn't I see because I was the first chair in the middle school band that uh, I could be this great trombonist. And she gave me this trombone solo and a song called trombones on the run, by the way, new record for most times saying trombone oh in episode of a podcast probably, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's a podcast out there about trombones you know, trombones on the run. is probably the name could of the be. podcast. That would be a great. It's your next project. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I got to pick that old, the old, the old trombone back up. Cause it's been a while, but the, uh, anyways, I, I remember feeling that sense from her that it was such a strong goal of hers. And she was someone I liked and respected and I valued her opinion of me and knowing that she would be disappointed if I mm. set the trombone down was a big impetus for me to continue to pick that trombone back up. And I continued to improve and I continued to become the first chair in that band. And I went off to high school with those skills, but it never, the the sense of satisfaction I got from gaining skill at the trombone was one of almost like the satisfaction of avoiding an uncomfortable situation, yeah. right? So there's some satisfaction there, but the big feeling was like, 
oh, I didn't disappoint Mrs. Boris. You know, yeah. like she really wanted me to stick with it. I did. And I got good and she praised me and patted me on the head figuratively. And, uh, and now I'm good at the trombone. But when I walked into my room and I saw the trombone, it wasn't anything like, uh, like later in life when I wanted to teach myself how to learn, play the guitar. Right. Oh, I should pick the trombone up and start banging out some scales, right. you know, like it never felt that way. And so while the absolute goal of me learning the trombone, which was mostly had by my trombone teacher was accomplished, her deep down goal, I think was have James become a great trombone player and have him love it. Yeah. yeah. I think if she would really could put a finger on it, that's what she would have said. But that goal of hers wasn't ever accomplished. Yeah. So I think we have to be, and again, you know, it comes from, I think a really well-intentioned place, but I think as parents, we have to be really careful about kind of the power that our influence can have over our kids. Like yeah. we want something so badly for our kids and our kids, want to do right by us and they want us to be happy and they don't want to disappoint us. And even if we have a super peaceful connected relationship with them, our desires for them, especially when it comes to these skills, like you said, like skills around playing a musical instrument or becoming good at a sport that they're not, we'll talk more later about more of like the interpersonal, like how right. goals for how we want to treat other people in our lives and how we want to move through the world. But these skills that are more like specific things that you can get good at, I think we have to be careful that our kids don't feel a sense of kind of pressure from us mm. to get good at them when we see a little bit of kind of a gift for something. Because it can be really exciting and it can be really easy to get carried away as a parent. But our opinions hold a lot of weight with our kids. And if it's not like a make or break thing, I think we do have to watch that. Right. Because, and, you know, I think we'll get into like our kids considering our opinions and our feelings about things, I think actually is a powerful instinct that we shouldn't ignore. And it can actually be really useful about the things we'll talk about soon, which is like, right. especially developing emotional intelligence and, you know, thinking out about how to interact and be a member of a family. But I think we do want to really reserve putting forth our desires. We want to really reserve uh, talking about our needs four times when it's actually our needs and not when it's just like, again, back on the long list of expectations my parents have for me. Mm -hmm. I really want to reserve that for the very most crucial things that are the very least debatable. And that our, my kids can look at and say like, okay, like, you know, basic example is my parents want to be able to sleep and I'm making a lot of, or my, my baby brother's asleep. And I just feel like making a lot of noise. I don't feel like developing the skill of making less noise in the house. It's like, well, you kind of should develop this skill. <laughs> sure. Right. So that's very different than, yeah, these other kind of more specific, like developing proficiency at a certain thing. Yeah. So, so I think what would you, I feel like a lot of people who are listening to this might think like, well, what if your kid like is, is like, seems to be enjoying something, but they've just like hit a wall. Like, isn't mm. it our job to kind of try to help them get through that wall and keep on pushing them through because of that, like really big feeling of accomplishment that you get? Like, what would you say to that? Cause I, I think right. that is a really common feeling. Yeah. So this is one that's going to be more art than science. I think in many cases where I'm not going to be able to put forth any kind of like prescriptive one size fits all solution necessarily. But I think basically, you know, it reminds me of when I was working in a role as a consultant with summer camps and a good colleague of mine, I was describing what I do. And he said, you know, you sound more like a coach than a consultant. And I asked him to kind mm -hmm. of differentiate yeah. what he felt like were the, the distinguishing factors between those. And he said, well, a consultant comes in and basically gives expert level advice with the expectation that probably the company will solve it. So yeah. my brother, Chris is a, like the a, company will implement the advice given. Right. And yeah, that's kind of like, yeah, the expectation. So my brother, Chris runs a, a branch of a big consulting firm and if Marriott brings him in and says like, what's the best technical solution for integrating all of our concierges across 5,000 hotels, he looks, does the research and says, here's the solution. And, and, and then they implement. By and yeah. large, they implement it, right? Versus a coach, which is kind of a softer role that comes in and mostly asks questions. And I'm going to borrow from Fizzle, which is a company that I used for online business training online. And they had a methodology that they used in for business, small businesses to talk to their customers, but I think it sort of applies to our kids too, which is basically start connecting with our kids and try to help them really figure out what it is their goals are and what amount of work they're willing to put in to achieve them. And so, you know, they, they talk about starting with 
a conversation around what they call the current reality. Let's talk about where you are right now. So in the case of a kid developing a goal, say around learning the trombone, might come in and say, hey, how's your tromboning going these days? And they might say, uh, it's going pretty well, but it's I'm a having... a good verb, tromboning. Yeah. I'm having <laughs> a lot of difficulty around this one solo. Uh, it's just, it gets too fast in the middle part. And I wind up, you know, kind of blending the notes together when it's really supposed to be a staccato, you know? And you say, huh. And so how's it going and trying to improve? Oh, well, I'm just, I've given up. Like, I just can't figure out how to do it. And you're like, okay, so how does that feel about for you? And they say, and this is where the next part comes in, which is trying to help them picture what the ideal state in their life would be. Right. And so they say, so in an ideal world, yes, I would be able to play the solo. Okay. Now let's talk about, and they might just say, well, it's actually just not that big a deal. Like I tried the solo. It's just like such a pain in the butt. I just don't feel like doing it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just going to move on to a different song or I'm going to set the trombone down for a little while. Cause I'm fed up with it right now. We need to make space for that to be okay. Yeah, we really <laughs> um, do. Maybe we should uh, go deeper on that in a second. But if they say, if they do say, okay, I really do want to do the solo. Like I'm in the, this jazz band and they're kind of depending on me to be able to do the solo. And kind of the assumption is that I'm going to be able to knock this solo out of the park by the time our concert comes around in three weeks. And then you can say, okay, great. Cause now, now you've heard them establish a goal, right? Mm-hmm. And this is the role of the coach. It's asking the questions, hearing the goals, and then helping them connect the dots between their current reality right. and their ideal Helping state. them formulate a plan to get to where they want to be. Right. So this is a harder version. It's a, yeah, a harder and rougher version of what we talked about in, oh, my kid wants to get good at Fortnite. Like, let's help them find good YouTube videos and give them time to practice. This is, I've already tried those steps and now it's just hard as all heck and I can't mm-hmm. figure it out. And this is like helping them work through, okay, this is just feeling hard on an emotional level. I'm feeling defeated. Okay. Well, what's the first thing we can do? Let's call the music teacher and, and you know, help work through the, the actual steps of ha- going from here to there. But the role here is, or the important part on the parent is mostly helping the kid understand that it's their goal. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it's helping them understand, or it's, I think it's kind of helping ourselves understand that it's their goal, getting clear on the fact that like, we are not setting this goal for our kid and placing pressure on our kid to meet it. Like if we can get clear with ourselves that, yeah, this is a real big goal that they have, then we can kind of be their coach and be their sounding board and help them figure out how to get there. I think. Yeah, we can think, establish ourselves as like a good listener. Like, yeah. Because sometimes they're just fed up and they just want someone to talk to about it, right? Right. Or, and they don't even want it to be fixed, really. <laughs> they just need to vent and share. Yeah. I think also I want to say too, like if, if our kids seem to be really engaged with something and then it gets hard or maybe it doesn't get hard and they just lose interest anyway, I, I would like to just kind of say that it wasn't a waste of time. Really, no matter what, it was never a waste of time. I think that's another fear that people have. It's like, oh my gosh, my kid just put so much time and effort into learning this skill and now they want to give up. Um, Maybe that's just not a goal they have for themselves anymore. And maybe definitely this experience provided them with so much learning. Like obviously they learned the skills associated with whatever it is they were becoming good at or spending a lot of time on. And those skills are almost definitely going to transfer to something else. Um, And they also learned like how to recognize when something isn't feeling Mm. in alignment with who they are anymore or with what their goals are for how they want to move through the world. And that's okay. Like I think I think we need more of that in the world. I think we need more space for people to recognize like when they're not living in alignment because that feels bad. (laughs) And um, when you can recognize that and put something down when it's not serving you anymore, that's actually, I think, a really important thing to be able to do for like long-term wellness and happiness. So yeah. It, it isn't, it hasn't been a waste of you and your family's time is what I'm saying. If, if your kids are super engaged with something and it's feeling awesome and then they, you know, slowly lose interest for whatever reason that, that just, there was so much more learning there. Right. And this is like back to that art piece because you're like, my instinct in those moments is like, okay, you've developed all these skills. You just showed a lot of like passion for this just last week. And now mm-hmm. all of a sudden, like the wind has totally gone out of the sails. Like what's the you know, I want to fix it. Basically. I want to totally. come in and say like, I also just remember 
how much joy are we getting out of this? Right, because we like, love, yeah. we know what it feels like to be in flow with something, right? And right. when our kids are in flow with something, it seems like every, there's, everything, to me at least, seems good. It's like they have this thing that they're so engaged with. They're so excited right. about it all the time. We can see that in them. And I think we need to remind ourselves, like, if they're going to put something down, like, they're going to find their next thing. And mm. it might not be right away. And that's okay, too. Everybody goes through kind of ups and downs of feeling really passionate and excited about things. And then we kind of flow away from that and have some time where we're kind of like a little bit more chill and a little bit more introspective. And that is also learning. Learning happens in those times too. Yeah. And being able to put things down, it's one of those fundamental skills that most people develop naturally. But oftentimes I think the conventional paradigm around education takes from people, both by just having forced subject matter and by, you know, like that pressure I experienced of like, sticking with the soccer team, sticking with the mm -hmm. trombone or sticking with whatever your version of it is out there. Because again, you don't want to be pushed to a break. Like for me being pushed to a breaking point, basically on the trombone took away my interest in learning instruments for right. a few years. That's like, another thing we haven't It wasn't mentioned, until right? college that I wound up picking up the guitar and being like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go take guitar lessons now. You right. Know? And I did get a lot of joy from gaining skill around the trombone, but like that pressure to stick with it meant that it was going to take a big act, like a big declaration. Like I'm now quitting the trombone, you know? Yeah. And like, that was a, like when you are put in a position where you have to make a big announcement to everybody, like I'm putting this down. Now. I'm quitting the soccer team. And I'm, probably feels quite a bit of shame around it too. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe, you know, you might feel pride that you stuck up for it. Who knows? But it has to be this huge emotional event rather than a casual setting down be like, eh, this was fun and I'm kind of yeah, over it. This was, this yeah. was good. And, you know, I think also when there has to be that huge deal, like I've seen this a lot of times with athletes, especially, but there was this guy in my college who was recruited to play like division one or division two basketball and just totally gave it up. Just mm -hmm. like, didn't do it. He came to my division three school, didn't even join the basketball team, didn't do anything like that. And he was like a guy who you could tell was a group just by looking at him was a phenomenal athlete. And I remember someone talking to him about it, just at this party I was at. And you could tell he didn't even want to talk about it because mm -hmm. like the implication was, and he, I think, even viewed it as, viewed himself sort of as a quitter or... Well, and maybe the implication there, too, for somebody who goes that deep with something and doesn't want to be doing it is like, who am I without this thing, right? You start to define yourself by the thing that everybody praises you for, and then... Well, no, he... And I think in his case, he was try he was expressly trying to go somewhere where he didn't have to define himself. Right, that's what I like mean. He, but but he wasn't, like, upset with himself about it. But, yeah, you could tell when it would get brought up constantly that it felt raw, that it felt... Mm -hmm. It wasn't something he was in a position to laugh off just yet. And I think, for me, and you, you brought this up when we were preparing for the show, but really recognizing in ourselves when we have a goal for our kids versus when they have a goal for themselves, themselves is like the ultimate is that that is just the ultimate question because, and sometimes it's okay when you have a goal for your kids and we'll get to this in just two minutes. I promise <laughs> when you, we have a goal for our kids that maybe they're not openly having for themselves in that moment. Yeah. I do think that actually is okay sometimes. And when it's something like a pursuit of theirs or a goal, like an actual like life goal they have for themselves, taking that step back, because I've seen both actually, like I'll, I'll just give two examples from our own real life and how they've wind up playing out. One was they're both around video games for our older son. Cause he showed like what I'll call like prodigious talent might be overstating it, but like pretty incredible talent in reaching a really high um, skill threshold in this game overwatch that he played. And as a six year old, he reached um, a level called diamond, which was like the top 15% of all the players playing this game. And at the time there were 30 million active players. And, you know, he was six playing against mostly teenagers and people in their twenties. And when he was moving away from that game, I remember asking him questions like, Oh, you've gotten like so good at this. Like you had a goal to reach grandmaster, which is the 0.1% of players, which is like an insane goal for someone who's six, basically. <laughs> but I said, I remember you had a role to reach or a goal to reach grandmaster. Like, you know, what's going on? Like you're, you're just like done with that. You've put so much time in, you know, I was saying things like that and I could tell I stopped thankfully yeah. because it was like really, really frustrating for him and it never actually spurred him. Maybe right. he would go play like a game 
Well, and um, thankfully it didn't because I think for a lot of people that might be might have been enough to get them to keep doing it when they didn't really want to. Yeah, and, and thankfully in my case it was like one or two conversations yeah. and I was able to recognize and walk away it from it. Quickly. And then it was interesting. So then like this game Fortnite comes around and takes the world by storm. And of course he built up all those skills playing Overwatch right. and applied the talents and got absurdly good once again and probably reached a higher level of skill in this game than he did in Overwatch. And now he's sort of moving away from yeah, it he's kind of a little it. bit. Yeah. And the inner voice in me is like, but you're so good. <laughs> and like, you know, it's a game like I've practiced a lot. And like all of his friends, when they come over, they st- sit and watch him play. And they're like, you're an actual God at this game. Like, how are you doing this? You know, kids older than him. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. It, if I'm being honest, it's hard for me to watch him not continue to have the goal he had two weeks ago, which was right. to continue to gain steam around it. But this time I've had the wisdom to not <laughs> but in. Well, and I think we, we start going into the territory too of like, obviously, I don't know. I think of kind of interfering with their self-knowledge too, right? Like yeah. when, when we talk about raising our kids the way we're raising them, a big piece of it for me is that I really, really want them to know themselves deeply and know what really drives them and what makes them happy and like who they want to be in the world. And when we start to insert a lot of our own kind of expectations around certain skills they're going to gain or goals they're going to meet, I think it it gets a little murky for them. They're like, wait a minute. They almost can't parse out. Like, do I have this goal because it's fulfilling for me or because like mom kind of thinks I should do it. And I've been guilty of that plenty of times and I'm still really working on it. But when I go back to like, I think about my priorities, which is more important to me that my kid really, really, really knows himself so that he can live Mm -hmm. a really happy life or that my kid develops some grit around doing things that he doesn't want to do anymore. Like that to me, when I, when I kind of like hold those two potential outcomes, it's easier for me to see like, oh yeah, this is why I'm making this decision. Even if there's some little voice in me that's questioning it, I'm going to go back to what my priority is for my kid and make the choice that seems most likely to help him get there. Right. And ultimately anything we do is just going to shift probabilities around. Nothing, none of these has clear paths that it will lead down, but I, I agree completely. Yeah, we're still I mean, guessing. For I think sure. when a kid is also for a certain, I would say pretty sizable percentage of people. And I'm certainly this way. Somebody else having a goal for me can often sour it to the point where I don't want to do it at all. Yeah. Just, you run that risk be- for sure. <laughs> just because they want me to do it. You Definitely. Know? I've worked on that and I don't think that was like a strength of mine growing up, but it was a, a way I was. And like, as soon as it became about pleasing someone else, yeah. that made me just not want to run in the other direction yeah, real fast. Exactly. Yep. I think a lot of people are like that. Yeah. And it's like this, it's a curse, right? Because it's like the more important something becomes to us, the more difficult it can be for our kids. And okay. So let me segue though, because I do think that there is an exception to that rule that I just said. And it's also an exception to the rule of like making our goals for our kids very clear. And this is, you know, this is actually, you know, you and I were talking about this beforehand. It's like, is this even goal setting? Like, is this, are we moving to basket three? Yeah. We're moving to yeah. basket three. All right. And this is around when our kid either needs to improve at something or needs to grow in an area where they do not have seemingly any express motivation to do it at all. Right. Um, and this is primarily around, and, you know, I think through conversations, through thoughtful conversations, we can help them to see that they probably do have a goal around it. But this is specifically in the realm of like the major ones that come to mind for me, and I'm sure there are others, is that around like emotional regulation and how we interact with others, interpersonal skills. Yeah. Um, so you, you seem like you had a thought. Do you want to jump in? No, go ahead. Okay. So the few ways we've seen it discussed in our group uh, are around like kids having a temper problem. So maybe they get super frustrated when their little brother comes in and knocks their tower over and winds up hitting the little brother. Or it can be around things like trying to work through you know, being away from mom and dad either during the day or going to sleep away camp or whatever. Uh, this can be around sleeping through the night. And, you know, obviously for like babies, you're not going to be able to have conversations with them, but there are kids who struggle with sleep all the way. I've seen this at summer camp through their teen years, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like uh, sleep is just a hugely emotional issue for people. Uh, it can be around changing eating habits. You know, if a kid is struggling with their health or is overweight or whatever else, these are goals that to adulthood, it can look like quitting smoking or, you know, just whatever. Right. Or it can look like managing our own tempers or helping ourselves to sleep better, you know, just 
goals that never go away unless we can strategize around them. And let's talk about it because I think this winds up being one of the times where parents, peaceful parents and parents who want to approach their kids with trust and openness wind up struggling the most. Like yeah. my kid is hitting me when he gets frustrated. This feels terrible. What do I do? Yeah. And I think this is a this one thing that I want to point out that's really important when it comes to like emotional regulation and interpersonal skills is I think the first thing we have to do is think about like, what's the problem that's happening? Mm-hmm. And then where, how old is my child and developmentally, what are they ready for? Because yeah. in some situations, like if you have a two-year-old who is hitting you when they get frustrated, that is as a parent, it's incredibly challenging. It can be incredibly triggering for you, yeah. especially just depending on like your own life history and past. And it can be incredibly hard to help them meet the goal you have for them of not hitting you when they're frustrated in a timely fashion. Right. Like some of these things, it's going to take time and kind of consistency around the message that you're sending about that behavior. And you're not going to necessarily see change in two days, especially if you're not employing like punitive measures, like putting them in a timeout or spanking them or something like that, which obviously we do not advocate for. So some, I think there has to be some check-in about like, what is my child developmentally ready for? And now it doesn't mean that let's say you do that and you're like, oh, well, they're not developmentally ready to kind of meet this goal. It doesn't mean you just give up and you have to live with that. But it it means that recognizing that the strategies you're going to employ to help them meet that goal probably are going to eventually work in combination with them just getting older and developing, but that it might be kind of like a longer road to get there. Does that make sense? It does. And I think kind of a landmark you can look out for is when a kid seems to completely comprehend why they ought to change this behavior or how that would benefit them and the family. And yet they're still not able to. Yeah. They don't have the skills yet. They're not. They're still not able to do it. So like I think about the glassy eyed look a three year old can give you after you're like, you can't hit your baby sister. And the kid is like, you know, just like looking around and is like, okay, mommy, you know, whatever that, that is not comprehension in my book. Comprehension looks like, and I'll, I'll just give an example from our life. Comprehension looks like, okay, you died in a video game, let's say, and you screamed really loud and threw down your headset and stormed away. And everyone in the house like felt really uncomfortable. And, um, and the, the youngest kid in the house was actually felt a little scared based on the, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of violent seeming behavior. Um, now you can approach that kid in the moment and you might not get full comprehension. They might just be wanting to talk about the frustrating thing that happened in the game. But if you approach that kid after the fact and say like, Hey, did you see the effect that that had on everyone? And, you know, how did you feel when you were working through that? And then the kid is like, oh yeah, no, I, I don't hope to act that way. Right. Cause now this is like the key turning point, I think, in helping our kids to develop new skills or to grow in these like emotional intelligence areas, because again, you're getting buy-in and you're hearing like, even if they're not like, well, I want to do the hard work to like figure out how to work on this. You're hearing, yes, this is, right. You're getting, I do understand what you're saying. You're helping them to understand why it would be advantageous to change their behavior, whether it's for their own good or whether you're helping them tap into their empathy about how their behavior is affecting other people. Yeah. And I think this is like that fine line that we discussed about um, when do our kids do something for us versus for themselves? Yeah. Because like for a kid, It's might not be, they might not think like, oh yeah, like waking up in the morning and talking about a plan to, on like what I'm going to do if the frustrating thing happens again today, like that's not fun. Mm -hmm. That's not, I don't feel like the thrill of improvement when I'm doing that. And they might say like, that sounds boring or I don't want to do that. But I think you can connect with them and say, okay, well, do you see how this is affecting me though? Like, do you Mm -hmm. see how this is affecting your little brother? Yeah. And I know it's not going to be fun for you in the moment, but I'm going to ask you to make the investment of time so that you can continue to work on these skills so that you can make progress toward as our whole family goal. I think you acknowledged this the last time it happened. We all have a goal of this happening less or maybe not. And I think you can help to paint the picture of like what it will look like once they've reached that goal. Like, why that will look better for everybody, including them. I think that helps them to buy into. And the fundamental difference here as compared to helping them to picture what it would be like to be an expert trombone player is that these behaviors are having a really significant effect on others. And 
I think they, I think kids also understand this logically as well, where Mm -hmm. your kid might say like, well, I just don't want to play the trombone. You can't point and say like, well, our whole family is going to be in worse condition if you don't versus, well, I just don't feel like, you know, working on my temper or I don't feel like taking the steps necessary to stop hitting my little sister. Like they want, I feel like reason, most people are reasonable and when that is pointed out to them. They can say like, Oh yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I yeah. Get it. And then I think I once you, people, you right, know? like once you have that buy-in, then you move on to helping them. Like a lot of times I think kids actually need ideas and practice around skills that they can use to get where we want them to be when it comes right. to emotional regulation or interpersonal skills. Like sometimes they simply just don't know what to do. They don't know an alternative. And so that's where like the hard work of coming up with coming up with a plan with them and coming up with like, what's, what are you going to, you know, how are you going to signal to me that you feel yourself going to that place and I can help you. And I think we've talked about this in other episodes, but um, I think recognizing that like, it's not going to be enough just to get them to buy into changing. They might really need some active ideas and help on like, well, well, how do I change? Right. Like I can't just say I want to change and change. So like, what are some actual alternatives I can try? And Right. And I know that we've at least nodded to, and we may have even done a full episode on it. We're now officially in that podcast territory where I forget what we've done full episodes on, but I will say that, and this is something we've definitely talked about in prior episodes, the time for strategizing around this kind of growth is very rarely the exact moment you notice that you need yeah, to. Yeah, <laughs> or even right on the heels of the yeah. explosion or the incident. Like you, That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. you're just the, – that your kid's adrenaline is still pumping. They're still coming down from that that elevated state. It's going to be really hard for them at, to actually access the logical part of their brain that they need to go through this process. Right. And I so, really like – um. sorry. I forget no, the book, The Whole Brain Child, is really helpful for that in thinking about like how to talk with your kids about emotional regulation and how to help them develop skills. We can try to remember to link to that in the show notes. But it talks about how like when the part of the brain that's firing when somebody is reacting really strongly to something right. um, is not the same part of the brain that you use for logical thinking. And you can't even access that when you're in that part of your brain. So, yeah. Well, right. And I think also the empathetic part of the brain, like obviously – at this point now, I'm so triggered. If I'm in that heightened state, I'm so triggered that like, I'm not thinking about whether my baby sister is upset. I'm thinking about how frustrated I am that I right. put all that time in to build that block tower versus like, and what I like to do, just a general productivity measure I take in my life so I don't forget things like this is because it can be just so easy to forget when you get wrapped up in life the next day. I like to just set an alarm for myself and after this happens, you know, try to be there, be present, use the tactics we've talked about from other episodes and then set an alarm for myself for the earliest possible time the next day. So, and that alarm will say something like talk with Ollie. If it's Ollie in our family who happens to be struggling and I'll go to him and I'll say, Hey, you know, yesterday we had this big, and I'll just make up an incident. Yesterday we had that really hard time when you got really frustrated because someone came in and turned off the Xbox in the middle of your game. And like I said yesterday, I totally understand why that was frustrating. Can you and I both try to strategize around what we might do today if you're either concerned like th- that something like that will happen again, or if it does happen, how we can proceed? So, mm-hmm. you know, nobody does get pushed on the ground. Nobody does get yelled at. And that, I think, winds, can wind up being a powerful conversation because I've talked about this and I firmly believe it, that you know, establishing expectations and also providing touchstones for kids. So like the expectation for the day is that we're going to make a new plan. If we we're going to try and follow a new plan, if we wind up getting frustrated and then the touchstone is the prior conversation. So, um, you know, if I do see that heightened state, you know, on the horizon, I can go to him and say, Hey, do you remember when you and I talked this morning and you and I made a goal to handle this differently, very different than, what did I tell you about what you need to do? Yeah. And and again, when these, when we're talking about these sort of like um, interpersonal goals that we have for ourselves, especially when it comes to growth around having a temper problem or what have you, it's so much more powerful when we have buy-in from both parties. Yeah. And I think we can often get buy-in from both parties by, you know, just talking about it before it happens rather than right. in the moment. Right. Talking about it when, when we're in a, 
calmer state. And I think sometimes people are hesitant to do that because they're afraid they're going to spoil the, if you're going through kind of a tumultuous time with a child. Yeah. You don't want to use time when everyone's happy to talk about these things. But mm-hmm. I think, I think it's worth pushing through that discomfort because I think in the end it's going to shorten like the length of the tumultuous time in general. Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me of working through one of our older kids who was struggling with sleeping. And he pointed out one night, when he like woke up in the middle of the night and came downstairs, he pointed out that it's so much easier. And I pointed out back that, hey, you have actually worked and tried to put yourself back to sleep when you wake up in the past, but you're not doing it now. And he said, oh, well, when I expect that I'm going to have to do it, mm-hmm. that's a lot easier for me than when I think I'm going to get help. Right. And I thought that was an interesting point as I thought about it after the fact where it's like, okay, that was a signal to me that I needed better expectations. Like, let's in talk place. about this during right. the day tomorrow so we can have a better plan in place for the night. Right. And then if he has that goal for himself, it's so much more likely than that when he wakes up, it's not a, it's not feeling imposed upon him, yeah, which sure. you know makes the already difficult thing of being an older kid who has difficulty sleeping through the night. Sometimes it's, it feels extra hard than if you feel like not only do you have difficult time sleeping through the night, but you're not supported right. or you're, you don't have any say in whether you have to work on it or not, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, sometimes if you're going to make it a group discussion for some things, you probably have to be willing to hear a dissenting opinion. You do. Yeah. Kid. And you um, have to be willing f- for like a completely, like you can't go into a conversation like that with like a specific outcome in your mind. Like, I think you really have to be open to the ideas that your kid might bring to it and be open to being flexible around like whatever your ideal outcome would be just the way that we're asking our kids to sometimes be flexible about their ideal outcome. Like you're going to probably end up meeting somewhere in the middle. And again, this goes back to the expectations thing. If you walk into the conversation, because some things are in your mind are going to be a straight up non-negotiable, right? You just can't keep going around hitting your sister. Yeah. So you come in with the premise of that conversation of we're going to need you to stop hitting your sister. Right. Let's talk about ideas for getting there. And and then you can get the kids feedback on what strategies might sound best. So like he might say, well, for now, when I'm playing my video games, I just need her out of the room because right. I'm so anxious. And then you can say, okay, well, that is or is not real. Well, the video games are in the main room in the house. So should we move the video games to somewhere else? Then you can kind of have that back and forth. But if you establish the presence, if the first thing you say is, we need to talk and about whether it's a good idea to hit your sister or, not or something, I don't think anyone would say that. But Or like about the, back to the sleep thing. If you approach a conversation of, let's talk about how the sleep thing is affecting the whole family be prepared for your kid to say like, well, I'm simply not ready. Right. And if you're hearing if, and if, but if you started the conversation by saying like, we're going to need you to start working on sleeping through the night without us coming up every mm-hmm. half an hour or whatever. Um, that's just a very different conversation. Right. I guess and you don't want to pull the rug out from under them, make them seem like they have a choice and be like, oops, you chose yeah, the just wrong be thing. Be clear yeah. about your intentions from the start. Right. I think exactly. And maybe some of this stuff, needs to be fleshed out more deeply in in full episodes, as we like to say. But I think the big goal that we had in talking about this stuff today is mostly like helping people to understand that, first of all, it's not, quote unquote, against peaceful parenting. You don't lose your peaceful parenting or unschooling badge if you do occasionally try to push hard when it comes to kids growing in certain areas, especially as it pertains to how they interact with others. And wanting to exercise as much wisdom as possible when we actually do just want to support our kids in growing in certain ways. Um, Yeah. And I think checking in with, again, checking in with like where our goals are overriding our kids' goals for themselves when it comes to like the less interpersonal emotional growth type things. I think that's easier said than done and really important work that we can do if we want our kids to engage with life on their own terms, I think, and to pursue things that really fulfill them. Yeah. And my, my ongoing parenting goal for myself is to create even more space in the future for my kids to establish their own goals. Cause I still do get wrapped up in having an emotional attachment to my kids pursuing something sometimes, if I'm being honest. And at the same time, having even more consistency around helping my kids work on things that they probably just need to work on. So those are your goals about goals. That's exactly. pretty meta. That's, I that, like that. Dude, that's why you picked up on it. <laughs> You saw what I did there. Yeah, that was great. Um, I think, yeah, I think we could probably have another conversation at some point around like intentional goal setting with our kids. We kind of talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but I don't think we should keep going on here, but maybe a conversation about like, at what age do you help kids start setting their own goals and being intentional about setting kind of like 
milestones that they would like to reach because as a grown ups, I find that that's helpful for me. So maybe Same-sies. next time. Same Z's. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us um, on this journey. Remember that each moment is a new opportunity to be the parent that you hope to be. Love you guys. See you next time. Thank you for listening to One Free Family. If you enjoy the podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron at onefreefamily.com slash support. Your support will help make this show better. Plus, you can get access to rewards and additional episodes by joining. Again, that's onefreefamily.com slash support. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.